Hi. Welcome to Midday Meditation on Wednesday, November 4th, 2020, here at the Cathedral of St. Philip in the Diocese of Atlanta. I'm Thee, Thee Smith, and it's my pleasure to join you in this intense week of our election of a President of the United States. Our election day, November 3rd and November 4th, today, the aftermath of that, but I'm instructed by our observance also yesterday on November 3rd of the commemoration of Richard Hooker, a theologian of the church who deceased on yesterday in the year 1600, November 3rd, 1600. Let's then begin with a opening prayer that observes a theologian and teacher of the church. The Lord be with you, let us pray. O God, by your Holy Spirit you give to some the word of wisdom, to others the word of knowledge, and to others the word of faith. We praise your name for the gifts of grace manifested in your servant Richard Hooker, and we pray that your church may never be destitute of such gifts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, I didn't notice that it was happening until a few hours after I had been studying the teaching and legacy of Richard Hooker that I had crossed a line as an Episcopalian. I could really get excited by someone who lived in the 1500s and his relevance for us today in the year 2020 as we're passing through this election. And uh, I was most struck by the collect appointed for Richard Hooker's day. O God of grace and truth, of peace, of truth and peace, you raised up your servant Richard Hooker in a day of bitter controversy to defend with sound reasoning and great charity the Catholic and Reformed religion. Grant that we may maintain that middle way, not as a compromise for the sake of peace, but as a comprehension for the sake of truth. Well, we too are challenged in this time to hold on to truth as well as to make peace without compromising our values and our commitments. How do we do both? How do we find a middle way as Richard Hooker famously celebrated in his time? I'm not the only one, by the way, who is impressed by his legacy for our time. Both conservatives and progressives, by the way, find a uh, uh, something to observe and, and to be instructed by with him. Uh, one writer responds by saying uh, that he helped her to uh, deal with people with whom she strongly disagrees. She had the attitude, uh, she says, uh, like uh, the character Dogbert in the Dilbert cartoon, who says, there's really no point in listening to other people they're either going to be agreeing with you or saying stupid stuff. And uh, when she realized that she had that attitude uh, as she was observing the legacy of Richard Hooker, she realized that she had to find a way to listen to people with whom she strongly disagrees and that he was a guiding coach for, for her and for us on that. So she quotes him as having said, uh, about, uh, she quotes, she acknowledges that, uh, that he celebrated a holding on to a diversity of ideas within the church, saying, carry peaceable minds and you may have comfort by this variety. Carry peaceable minds and you may be comforted by the variety. Uh, so how can we have that kind of comfort, the kind of comfort that we'll be uh, invoking in a few weeks during Advent when we sing that famous hymn of the church, quoting uh, Isaiah, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Well, Richard Hooker gives us a following instruction. He was preaching a sermon in which he was trying to describe his um, way of bringing together Catholics and Protestants, Catholics and the Puritans of his day. And he said, uh, he made a remark uh, that he was looking forward to seeing some Roman Catholics in heaven, even after the kinds of controversies they were having in his lifetime. And uh, he was challenged by a Puritan, Protestant Puritan minister 
theologian who said to him, How dare you expect them to be with us? They do not believe in justification by faith. And, um, and then Hooker responded in this way, uh, Those who do not rightly understand the means by which God provides for our salvation may nonetheless be saved by that salvation even if they don't rightly hold the doctrine. Um, and so he, and he, he uh, concluded that claim with the following remark. God is no sophist eager to trip us up whenever we say something amiss, but a courteous tutor ready to amend what in our weakness or ignorance we say ill, and to make the most of what we say a right. So here's the virtue he espoused, uh, and as represented by our loving creator, who is not waiting to find some way in which we don't properly believe or espouse or confess this or that, but instead is always available to help us correct places where we're mis- where we misunderstand or misconstrue reality, uh, and then to s- embrace and celebrate places where, we, where we've got it right. That's the model he espoused. And the question is, how can we find that path, that middle way between holding on to our tar, but at the same time making peace with where people have got it right or are uh, or intending yearning for something that is right? It's remarkable that that perspective of Hooker converges with Ignatius, um, with Ignatius of Loyola, who, as a Roman Catholic theologian, made this claim: that every good Christian uh, needs to be ready to save the proposition of another, rather than simply condemn it as false. If you're unable to save the proposition, Uh, you should ask, if you're unable to figure out how the other person's proposition can be right, ask them how do they understand it. And if they don't understand it, uh, you should ask them, he says, with love, how can they persuade you that it's right? Um, And then, if they even fail in that regard to be persuasive to you, you should figure out a way to represent their perspective in a way that could be compelling for you. Uh, all appropriate means should be used so that if they misunderstand, if their own proposition is not correctly understood, you may save their proposition by representing it in a way that's compelling for you. Uh, now, I had a teacher who, a, a colleague and teacher, who explained how he took this perspective, the Richard Hooker, Ignatius of Loyola perspective, with him into uh, people that he found, quote unquote, repulsive because of their views. Terrorists, he says. He went to Northern Ireland. He talked to Yasser Arafat and to Uh, and to those whom Arafat opposed, uh, to uh, Prime Minister Shamir. He went to Ariel Sharon. And and in all of these ways, he tried to find ways in which um, their their perspective of what they were doing and espousing could be um, explained in a way that he and his community would find compelling. How can you explain it to me in a way that would be persuasive uh, from my perspective, from my community, from my constituency? That was the challenge that he took on. That's the challenge in our time. And our scriptures pointed for today, in particular the gospel for the feast of Richard Hooker, uh, highlights this call this challenge. It's our Lord's Prayer from the Gospel of John. In 
which Jesus makes this prayer to his Father. He says, I ask not only on behalf of these disciples here today, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What an incredible challenge. And of course, this is our Lord's prayer for his disciples. It addresses most often divisions in our church between Christians who are polarized on both sides of some issue. As we are in our day in our church, yes, even around this national election. Paul says it in this way, that may be more familiar and more persuasive or compelling. That was John 17, verses 20, as appointed for the feast of Richard Hooker. But in another text, Paul writes uh, in this Pauline epistle to the Ephesians, we read, For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. That's our commission. At every place where we find polarization and groups pitted against one another, to find a middle way to make peace between them, breaking down the middle wall of hostility. And Richard Hooker, like the Protestant and, uh, and uh, Ignatius of Loyola the Catholic, both have this Christian principle of inviting the other person's, the other group's perspective um, to inform one's own in a way that could be compelling from one's own perspective. Why do you believe that? What is it you believe? Explain it to me so that I could be persuaded by it. Let me help you understand it in a way that would be compelling and persuasive for me and my group. Let's conclude with a prayer that will uh, assist us in that regard as we go to our intercessions for this meditation day. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and did send your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through the same thy son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite your own prayers as we uh, recall to mind those who need uh, our Lord's uh, rescue and uh, strength and wisdom in this hour. Uh, and circumstances and situations that come to your mind and heart for intercession. We pray especially for those who've presented themselves from public office, uh, that they might have grace to accept the will of God and that we might continue to support them uh, with our prayers and interventions. Let us pray. O oh God, you are so much more able to accomplish for us things beyond our imagination, needs, desires, and requests. We ask you to give us those things which we cannot right, at, rightly ask for, but which you know we need. And also to give us wisdom to ask for things according, in accordance with your gracious will. 
all these blessings we ask in your name, O Lord. Amen. And now receive this benediction as we go forth into the rest of this week, uh, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit to accomplish far more for us than we can ask or imagine. Receive our blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of God's glory with rejoicing, to the only God most wise, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and dominion. And may you go forth in the power of the Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessing. Amen.